1850, this novel, The Mistake of a Lifetime or The Robber of the Rhine Valley, was published in Boston by Frederick Gleason, who was the owner of Gleason's Pictorial and also the owner of the Flag of Our Union. It started out in serialized form. This is the second installment. And I determined that this is definitely something that was written by Matthew Franklin Whittier, myself in the 19th century. It was signed with a pseudonym, Waldo Howard, which most people apparently took and still take to have been an actual author's name. It was assumed that this was a young author publishing his first novel who had approached Frederick Gleason with it. And Gleason was so impressed that he ended up paying this young uh, Waldo Howard $3,000, which was a huge sum in 1850, an unheard of sum. So what I'm going to do is give some of the backstory of this uh, briefly, and then I'm going to talk about the history of its publication and some of the clues that I found. Um, we have to go back once again, and for people who have kept up with this blog, I apologize, but for any new readers, I have to go back over this territory. Matthew had freelanced as a ghostwriter for this fellow named Francis Duravage for many years. Uh, he started out with an encyclopedia, historical encyclopedia in 1835, as I've determined. And then in 1845, he ghost wrote uh, three novels for Duravage, had to do with true crime. He was also ghostwriting for a fellow named Charles Burdett in New York City in 1845-46. Those were Christian children's novels. And uh, in 1848, early 1848, as near as I can tell, Duravage teamed up with a fellow named George Burnham, another con artist, because both of them were con artists, and George Burnham had money. So Duravage uh, teamed up with George Burnham, the money bags, and they approached Matthew. And because Matthew had a history of working for Duravage, he wasn't suspicious. And apparently this was a time when Matthew needed money for his second family, uh, his, his kids. And he agreed to sell to Duravage and Burnham, some of the stories out of his portfolio going back as far as 1830, because Matthew started publishing 1825 when he was 12 years old. He had a long track record. So he had this huge portfolio of work that had not been published. And I'm sure the agreement was, I'll pick out certain stories that you can publish under your own names. And uh, they were of two different types. One of them was humorous anecdotes from real life, either Matthew's life or somebody else's. And the second category was romantic adventure tales. Most of them set in other countries, not all of them. And these two types, he was going to permit Duravage and Burnham to publish under their own names. Apparently what they did is they gave him a bogus contract and he didn't check the fine print. And once he'd signed it, he had signed away his entire rights to the whole portfolio, see? And they proceeded that year to start publishing it. They published it in the Flag of Our Union, the Spirit of the Times, and a bunch of other. They started out with small newspapers that wouldn't check, you know, or wouldn't be suspicious. And then when they saw that Matthew was not going to sue them and was not going to publicly protest, which he didn't for various reasons, including that he was deeply involved with the Underground Railroad and the abolitionist movement, as an um, undercover agent, probably working for William Lloyd Garrison at some point. But uh, at any rate, they got bolder and they started publishing in these major publications in Boston, the Flag of Our Union and Gleason's Pictorial, and Matthew still didn't challenge them, publicly at least. So uh, this went on for a while, and Duravage took most of the adventure stories and published them under his own name. So in the flag of our union, say in 1849, you will find a number of these. Now for any historians that might ever watch this, not all of the ones under Duravage's name were written by Matthew. He apparently wrote a handful of them himself. And since he was a sociopath, they're cold hearted, they're cruel. Matthew was never cruel, see? So you could, I mean, it's a total disconnect on the spiritual level and the psychological level, even though he might've been able to imitate his style somewhat. So uh, what Matthew apparently did was, I don't know whether somebody talked to him about it and told him the old adage that uh, success is the sweetest revenge. But anyway, he decided he would write an adventure novel 
that beat all of the things that Duravage had stolen from him. And that's what Mistake of a Lifetime was. Typically, of course, he signed it with a pseudonym. What he apparently did was he used an agent. And this agent did not reveal that Waldo Howard wasn't a real person. He presented Waldo Howard as a new author, the young man, see? So everybody assumed that this was a fledgling author and not somebody who'd been publishing for 20 years, see? Uh, who had a tremendous track record and was really one of the top writers of the 19th century, if the truth were known. So uh, the description has it, and I'll read one of, the, one of the reviews to this effect. The description has it that Frederick Gleason started reading, and there's no mention of an agent, but there had to have been an agent, so the agent was trying to get his commission, so he kept upping the price. Or I should say that Frederick Gleason kept offering more and more. The more he read, the more he offered, and then the agent was holding out. And uh, Gleason finally went up to $3,000 plus royalties, you know, a huge sum. It was on the strength of this money, probably, that Matthew was able to invest in the carpet bag, the uh, humorous magazine that uh, began publishing in Boston in 1851. Matthew was a financial investor. We know that from one statement that's been found. And he was a very heavy contributor to that newspaper. So that's probably how he could afford to do that. It's also how he could afford to travel to Europe, writing as Quails, the travelogue for the Boston Weekly Museum, which was nefariously claimed by and for the entertainer Ashen Dodge, who later bought out that paper in mid-1852. Historians believe the scam that Ashen Dodge was the writer of Quails. There's no possible way. None of these people had any prior track record. Duravage had no literary track record. Burnham had no literary track record, although Burnham pretended to be Duravage's protege. Ashen Dodge couldn't even write his own songs. He had to run contests to get songs. He had plenty of money, but he didn't have the talent to write. He certainly didn't have the talent to write like Quails did. I don't know why historians don't look into these things. They're so obscure that one or two scholars will publish on them, and they don't really look deeply into the matter. And then everybody cites them, and everybody believes it, and it just spreads like urban legend, you know. It's, it's amazing how much urban legend is in scholarship once it gets in print in black and white. Now, this story, I was able to convince one bookseller on Aid Books, which is a clearinghouse for antique booksellers, that Matthew wrote it. And he put Matthew's name on that as the author where he was selling it. But it's gone now. I looked for it today, and it's somebody has purchased it. So that's interesting. Um, anyway, so what we're going to do is, is go through the history of this, because it's pretty interesting, I think. And I'm going to have to go by my notes. It's so complex. So I've given the background. I want to give examples of Duravage and Burnham stealing Matthew's novels because there were a couple novels that were unpublished that Matthew had written. And when Duravage and Burnham got finished publishing all the short stories, which is relatively easy to get an editor to accept a short story, they still had these novels. Well, Duravage managed to get one of the ones he'd stolen published in Ballou's Pictorial, and the way he did it was that when Frederick Gleason sold Gleason's Pictorial to Maturin Ballou, who I think was an associate editor or part of that uh, magazine, and Ballou took it over, it became Ballou's Pictorial, and Ballou immediately hired Duravage as an associate editor. And at that point, immediately starts to appear in the first edition, Steel and Gold or the Heir of Glenville uh, in 1855. Later, he published that, or somebody published that as a book in 1892, and they shortened the title to The Heir of Glenville. So I have that. Um, here is the book, The Heir of Glenville. You can still find copies of that. I think there's one on eBay. And this is the uh, volume 8, Baldur's Pictorial, 1855. And that's the one that this story appears in in serial form that it first appeared in. So um, let's see here. I've got to stay organized. Then George Burnham, not too much before, published another one of Matthew's novels called Nell Noel, The Lightkeeper's Treasure. It's found in the December 9, 1854 Flag of Our Union, which was also published by Maturin Ballou. 
And that also was later published in book form, but I see no registration mark and no date on that book where I found it online. I don't have a physical copy of that. So both of them published Matthew's novels after they got finished publishing Matthew's Adventures short stories. Now we move to the April 17, 1850 Oddfellow. It's a, it's a Boston a uh, newspaper called The Odd Fellow, which of course was published by the group The Odd Fellows. Matthew was a member of The Odd Fellows from, for several years, from 1843 actually. He helped found one of the lodges in Portland, Maine, called the uh, Ancient Brothers Lodge. So um, Matthew, since 1829, had been occasionally writing, signing with a star or single asterisk. I've told you that that was Matthew in the New York Tribune, 1844, 1846. It was not Margaret Fuller, who was the literary editor. That was Matthew continuing to use his star as he had done for years and as he continued to do for years. So here we have in The Odd Fellow a review of Mistake of a Lifetime. He wrote his own review, and I will uh, read it for you. I had to print that out, stop the video and print it out. No matter how much I prepare for these things, it seems like there's one thing I've missed. So this is in The Odd Fellow of April 17, 1850, and we read, A new romance. We have received from the publisher, F. Gleason, Boston, a new and brilliant tale entitled The Mistake of a Lifetime or The Robber of the Rhine Valley. It is a story of the mysteries of the shore and the vicissitudes of the sea, embracing in its field an almost boundless extent of romance, depicting with a faithful and vivid pen the peculiarities of robber life, piracies upon the high sea, the influences of the gaming table, the power of jealousy, the absorbing interest of mystery, and the power of love and beauty. The interesting period of the story has enabled the author to produce some delightful specimens of the legends of the Rhine, as well as to give the reader some startling characters among the actors of his tale, taken from life and the events of everyday occurrence. The story opens in a tap room in London, and the first female character introduced is one of such surpassing loveliness and under circumstances so peculiar and interesting that the reader becomes at once absorbed in her history and fate. Altogether, the work is one of remarkable and intense interest. But we will not anticipate the pleasure that the readers of the book must realize. Let no one fail to procure the mistake of a lifetime. It is for sale at all the periodical depots and bookstores at the extraordinary low price of 12 and a half cents, though gotten up in the very best style of publication. It is destined to find an immense sale paramount to that of any work published for many years. Now, this is one of the very few times, or maybe even the only time I can really think of, where Matthew has really done something unethical. But it, it happens that I do have all of Matthew's emotional memory. I have total access to Matthew's emotions and, hence, to all of his motives. I know exactly why he did everything he did. Now, you can... Take that with a grain of salt, however big a grain of salt you want to, but I've been researching this carefully for 13 years, and that's the conclusion I've come to. And I'll tell you what was going on in Matthew's mind and heart when he wrote this review. First of all, it had been panned mercilessly, and I'll give you a couple examples of that soon, and I'm going to read extended excerpts from these reviews, which I think they're evidence. I think it's necessary. And what Matthew wanted to do for one thing is what I said, he wanted to show up, uh, he wanted to pull a trick on Duravage and Burnham. He wanted to go to their publisher, and Gleason, Gleason's Pictorial was a conservative, well-funded magazine that Matthew normally, he would normally never have darkened their doors at all. And here his stuff was getting published day after day after day in Gleason's magazines and newspapers, and the uh, flag of our union and Gleason's pictorial. So he decided anonymously through an agent to go right under their noses, directly to the guy that was publishing all their stuff and induce him to publish something that was even better than anything that they'd stolen from him. See, to outdo them completely. It was, it was revenge in a sense. And he certainly accomplished it beautifully. 
But what happened, of course, was that the liberal editors were not pleased with anything that Frederick Gleason had had done, see? So they were already disposed to ridicule Frederick Gleason because he was conservative, you know? So there's that, and we'll see that a little bit later. But the reviewers were panning this and making fun of how much money Frederick Gleason had paid for it. And the, the disconnect, the uh, misunderstanding was that they all thought this was a new author. Therefore, his stuff couldn't be any good. They didn't understand that this was the real co-author of A Christmas Carol. This was the real author of The Raven and Annabelle Lee, see? So they had no idea who they were dealing with here. Well, anyway, he got fed up with these reviews and decided to write one of his own, I'm sure, just to, to explain to people what it was, okay? Because the reviews weren't even talking necessarily about the book. They weren't even reviewing the book. They were just ridiculing Gleason for having spent $3,000 for the, for, you know, for a new author. See? So he explained what the book was. And there was another motive, a deeper motive. And that is that he wanted to provide moral education to the public, just as he'd been doing in the books he ghost wrote for Charles Burdett in New York. He was a deeply committed, albeit esoteric Christian, and he wanted to change society, to elevate society. And the best way to do it was to entertain the masses and slip in moral instruction. So that's what he was doing here. And it had to be entertaining. It had to be a swashbuckling tale. But then there was an even deeper motive, and that was personal. He was exercising his own inner demons, which he did again in 1855 with uh, the rag picker or bound and free. So there's a great deal of himself in here. There's a great deal about Abby, his, his uh, beloved first wife and soulmate. There's a lot about, there's jealousy and the mistake of a lifetime, I would say, although it's never clarified in the novel what the mistake of a lifetime was. Apparently the mistake of a lifetime was doubting Abby toward the end of her life before she went uh, to convalesce from um, consumption probably in the late 1840, uh, returning, no, late 1839, excuse me. And she probably was away for several months from December 1839 to July of 1840, when she came back and gave birth to their second child, a daughter, Sarah. So uh, apparently his business was failing and he was drinking. Uh, everybody drank in the early days, so he picked up the habit. But uh, the business was failing and he was struggling to support Abby. And uh, for whatever reason, he started to feel jealous. It's a long story. I don't want to get too far into that. But it's, it's all in this book, symbolically. All these characters, or most of them, are Matthew and Abby. You know, Abby appears over and over in different characters, you know. Um, the opening that, that has this uh, young lady, uh, maybe... 14 or 15 or something like that. She's a prisoner, so to speak, in a tavern. Um, I don't want to give too much of it away, but uh, the opening has uh, the character that Matthew identifies with rescuing her from this situation. So um, there's a whole lot of his deep personal emotional life that's, that's embedded in this where nobody would ever know that he was drawing from these things and nobody would ever know he was working through his own uh, really, it's survivor's guilt. Matthew suffered terribly from survivor's guilt and blamed himself for anything that could have worn Abby down, you know, toward the end. So uh, that was part of it. Really, he does it even more so in uh, The Rag Picker Abound and Free in 1855. That novel, George Burnham never got his hands on that novel, but he tried to associate his name with it in 1855. Some historian picked it up and today, the historians imagine that George Burnham, who is an impossible candidate for that book, The Rag Picker, they believe that he wrote it. I've gotten that disputed now in WorldCat. Um, OCLC has accepted my disputation of that claim, and they've included Matthew Franklin Whittier as a possible, you know, and also ran or whatever. Well, anyway, that's Matthew's own review for his own book. Now, the first I found of any of this, the first encounter I ever had with The Mistake of a Lifetime was in the Boston Weekly Museum in the May 18, 1850 edition. 
and I'm going to have to clear the decks here, but I just happen to have that with me. This again, I've shown it many times. That's the Boston Weekly Museum. This is 1850. It's uh, way too big for this little folding table, and the pillow is too small, but we're going to go ahead and open it anyway. I don't have a aerial view of this, but you know what it looks like when I open this book. Let's see here. I have to be a little gentle. One of these pages is loose. A couple of them are loose. They're fading. This 1850 volume is not quite in as good a shape as the 51. Now, Quails appears on this page. This is page 389 in the May 18, 1850 edition. On the left side of the page is Quails from our flying correspondent, writing in Boston, May 7th. Under that is something that might or might not be Matthew, too, because he wrote under several different pseudonyms, you know. But uh, over on the far right, on the top right corner, it says a card. It's spelled K-A-R-D. Cards were like little notices. People would publish public notices, and it was called a card. But this is all written in Matthew's trademark misspelling. He started using this in 1826 as a character named Joe Strickland. One historian decided that that was a lottery shop owner writing kind of an advertisement or a puff for himself. It was not. That was Matthew Franklin Whittier who had run away from home and he was writing from New York and then Boston. Um, and he used this style. It's a very, very heavy misspelling style. It's, it's, everything is as badly misspelled as it possibly could be, and it's very difficult to wade through. I'll show you an example here from the um, New England Galaxy. Matthew started publishing as a boy of 12 in the New England Galaxy in the spring of 1825. This one is in 1826. And I'll just put it on the screen just to give you an idea of what Joe Strickland looked like. When Matthew started his one known series, the one series that he's known for by historians, Ethan Spike in 1846, he used this same style, but he backed off on the misspelling. There's still malapropisms and meaningful misspellings in there, but it's not as so thick that you almost can't read it. You know, it's occasional misspelled words or, you know, Yankee dialect and so on. The Joe Strickland style was as thick with mistakes as he could possibly make it. And he would return to that every once in a while. He'd return to it. I have maybe four or five or six examples over the years where for some particular reason he returned to that style. Basically, he's the only one that mastered it to the extent that to that extent. See, so when you see that and there's any other indication that it's probably Matthew, it's Matthew Franklin Whittier. So this, if this is taken as a defense against the critics by the author of The Mistake of a Lifetime, Waldo Howard, if we take it that way, which is what it is, then this is definitely Matthew Franklin Whittier. That means that Matthew Franklin Whittier, open and shut case, smoking gun, definitely was the author of The Mistake of a Lifetime. We've got it nailed here, okay? If you understand the background. I'm gonna read this card and you'll see the misspelling on the screen. Dear Sir, D-E-E-R-C-I-R, -E -E I don't think much of them papers as blow up my last great romance, the bobber of the rind. I want you all to understand that I think you are porterhouse critics and don't know but little. I want all of you to understand that I am a gentleman that has a good right to make some literary pretension. Most of my time has been spent in the service of government, it is true, but I have traveled considerable. I have been to Cuba. Cuba. The man that wrote Velasco is down on me, I see, but I wrote the Monument Mountain years after Bryant did. If you don't stop talking about my novelette, I will astonish you all, for I am editor of the Flunky Flag, a paper 
that circulates more largely than the combined circulation of all the other papers in the world. Any of you fellers would have been proud to have writ the mistake, but you can't write anyway. Yours in defiance, Raldo Blowhard, Esquire, which of course is a um, distortion of Waldo Howard. Now let's go back through this because in, in and amongst the joking, he's being serious. So first off, I want all of you to understand that I am a gentleman that has a good right to make some literary pretension. Well, he was the co-author of A Christmas Carol. I can prove it, I'm telling you. And he was the real author of The Raven and Annabelle Lee. And he was the real author that people think was Margaret Fuller signing as the star in the New York Tribune. And he wrote five poems that Elizabeth Barrett Browning plagiarized in 1844, including Wine of Cyprus and Lady Geraldine's Courtship. So he's being absolutely literal, even though he's using bad spelling and, and acting like a fool. And this was Matthew's modus operandi. He's a clown. He acts like a fool, but he's quite serious. All right. So let's go through this again. He says, most of my time has been spent in the service of government. Well, he's talking about Quails, who's on the same page. Quails pretends to be an old man working for the government. In actuality, Matthew Franklin Whittier apparently was working as a traveling postal inspector. So he was working for the government in recent years. He says, I have been to QB. Now, I have quite a bit of evidence that probably at age 14, for maybe like three months, Matthew tried to run away to sea. And he had a bad stomach and uh, had terrible nausea and, and so on. He had that trouble when he went to Europe in 1851. He almost died from it on the way back in a gale. Apparently he was bleeding, not only throwing up, but bleeding. And the doctor despaired for his life, see? So he had a bad stomach all his life. And he apparently had tried to go to sea and he couldn't take it. And they put him off at Cuba. And maybe he worked as a clerk in a store and hated it for a while. And then he got picked up by a ship going back to the United States. That's what I've extrapolated. Now, there's many clues, but one of them shows up in Abbey's work that Matthew published posthumously in the Weekly Museum in 1849, 1850, around this same time. So one of them called Master Palmer, which is in the February 23, 1850 edition the, the boy that represents Matthew, because an awful lot of her work was drawn from real life, and Matthew appears in her stories two or three times. One time he's called Frank, here he's called Charles. But uh, in this story, it says, three years passed thus, and then there came a letter from him. This is after he ran away from home. It was addressed to Constant, who was their gardener, and postmarked Havana, Cuba. So Abby actually drew, apparently, from Matthew's real history in as much as she has her character run away to Cuba, see? Well, Matthew wasn't in Cuba for very long, but here, as Raldo Blowhard, he says, I had been to Cuba. And then there's more, which I've looked up. He says, I am the editor of the Flunky Flag. What he means is that his material for the past year has been appearing like every issue or every other issue in the Flag of Our Union in Boston, and it's his stuff, even though it's signed by Francis Duravage and his uh, pseudonym, The Olden, see? So Matthew's work, the very work that he's trying to outdo by mistake of a lifetime, has been appearing on a weekly basis in the flag of our union for a whole year. So that's what he's referring to. That's as close as he can come to saying that. And then at the end, he says, any of you fellers would have been proud to have writ the mistake but you can't write anyway. That's absolutely literal. And this is, this is typical of Matthew's modus operandi. He'll clown around. Probably he's not the only one that uses this technique. He'll clown around, but the last thing he says is, is he's dead serious about it. See? So he means it. This is really a good, this is a brilliant novel, especially given what he was trying to do with it. See, He had to appeal to the masses because he was trying to provide them moral education. So it had to be kind of swashbuckling and so on. But it's beautifully written. It's a very intricate plot, you know. Um, I just think it's magnificent. But I will tell you this much. When I first read this card, I interpreted, I knew it was Matthew because I knew by style, it's the Joe Strickland style that he brought back every once in a while. So I knew this is Matthew Franklin Whittier. I assumed that he was ridiculing somebody else's novel. 
And so when I found the mistake of a lifetime, figured out what it was and found it, I was so prejudiced by that mindset, by assuming that Matthew had ridiculed it, that I perceived it as being stuffy, unbearably stilted is the term I used. And I had that in my first book before I revised it was actually in there like that. I, th I think I left a little mention, you know, of that in the book. So preconceptions are everything. They're so powerful. And, and I include myself, see? So I panned the book myself at first. So all of these people, because of Matthew's subterfuge, they're all primed to think that this is a fledgling author, a young man, and this is his first novel, see? If they understood that this was the real co-author of A Christmas Carol, they would have taken it very differently, see? So a lot depends on what you think. A lot of your reaction to me will depend on your automatic, unthinking assumption that I have to be crazy. I can't actually be the reincarnation of Matthew Franklin Whittier. That we know. It's absolutely impossible. So therefore, your mind now will filter everything I say and everything I present through this filter of already having decided that I can't possibly be right about this, see? So, I mean, that's the way prejudice is. And it's not necessarily, um, it's not necessarily done maliciously. It's just the way the human mind works. Now, let's go by date order here in terms of what transpired next. I just, I just found something quite interesting. Now, what happened was that Frederick Gleason decided to promote this in his own way. And his own way was to send out advertisements, which looked kind of like reviews, to papers all over the country. And uh, as we will see, he actually bribed people, he paid people, or offered the, the editors certain amounts of money to print these quasi-reviews, these advertisements. And they were all over the place. So we will see an example of one quoted here. So there's no need to uh, quote that. Now, in the Boston Daily Evening Transcript of April 8th, 1850, there is a negative review of The Mistake of a Lifetime. He doesn't really get around, even if you read the book, because he doesn't really get around to the content at all. He's just bent on ridiculing the circumstances by which Frederick Gleason purchased it, see, and purchased the rights to it. I'm going to read this at length. And again, I apologize for that. You can kind of fast forward if you want to, but this is evidence and it's important to see what they were saying. And there had to have been a lot more reviews like this. Apparently they were all over the place. The editors were jumping all over this. So this paper says, literary wares at a premium. It is pleasant to see that the law laid down by Adam Smith that an undue increase of the supply of an article diminishes the price does not hold good in literary affairs. Notwithstanding the multiplication of authors in our days, when the rarity is to find not the man who writes and publishes, but him who does not, is even more so today. The present seem truly halcyon days for the scribbling race. These reflections have been suggested by seeing the following modest paragraph adroitly insinuated in the editorial columns of some of our most respectable newspapers during the last two or three weeks. So here's the quasi review from Gleason. A great work. Mr. F. Gleason, publisher, Boston, has now in press and will publish on Saturday, April 13, a splendid original romance entitled, quote, The Mistake of a Lifetime or The Robber of the Rhine Valley a story of the mystery of the shore and the vicissitudes of the sea by Waldo Howard Esquire. The manuscript of this work has been purchased at an outlay of some $3,000, besides which the author demands a portion of the profits of the work. Many years have been employed upon it, and we understand that no small competition was evinced by the trade to secure it, but Mr. Gleason appears to have been the fortunate one who has obtained it. And then the editor continues, fortunate, fortunate Mr. Gleason, and thrice fortunate Waldo Howard Esquire, how shall we restrain our eagerness till the 13th of April, when the first installment of your Robber of the Rhine Valley is to be given to an impatient public? 
and generous, generous Mr. Gleason. If you had paid over your $3,000 to Irving or Cooper, we might have thought it was merely a plain business transaction in which the reputation of the author was an earnest of the success of his work. But here you select a writer who, for all the world know to the contrary, may be a man of straw, a name, and nothing more, and on him you lavish a princely sum for his maiden romance. We can imagine him coming to you with his manuscript, a dark-haired, pale-faced young man, with a dash of the Rhine bandit in his expression. Bashfully and timidly he places his work in your hands. You read a chapter, and your eyes sparkle with satisfaction. Your exquisite taste in literature is agreeably piqued. You read on further, another chapter and another, until delighted and overpowered, like the Earl of Wilmington, when he read the original copy of Thompson's Seasons, you summon your clerk and say, give this young man $500. Waldo Howard, Esquire, is dumb with gratitude and is about retiring to order a good dinner at Parker's when you say, give him $1,000 more. Waldo Howard, Esquire, pulls out his handkerchief and bursts into tears. You read on. The robber of the Rhine Valley grows more and more intense in its interest. It fairly takes you off your feet, and as you reach the close of one of its most thrilling scenes, you cry out, Pay Mr. Howard a thousand dollars more. Waldo H. Esquire throws himself at your feet, but you cannot take your eyes from the manuscript, and at length, in despair, you say to your clerk, Pay him five hundred dollars more and send him off. He will ruin me if he stays here any longer. Whereupon Waldo H. Esquire seizes the money, kisses your hand, and flies along Tremont Row, down Court Street to Parker's, where he orders a venison steak and a bottle of Heidsink. Emboldened by the champagne, he begins to think that he has been imposed upon, that he has sold the robber of the Rhine Valley at a sacrifice. He rushes back to you, and most readily do you accede to his, quote, demands for a portion of the profits of the work in addition to what you have already paid him. So that's the kind of review. I mean, it's sort of praise in a way, but it really doesn't talk about the, you know, the book at all. It just, ta it just ridicules this process of a brand new author getting paid that much money. What really happened is that the agent kept pressing, you know, and he must have, he must have hired a good agent, you know, who probably said, well, there's other people that want this and so forth and so on. Who knows? Now, there's another review here just to give you an idea. Back in the day, the word rhino meant cash. Okay, that was slang for cash. So the Buffalo Courier says, quote, The Boston papers having indulged in some pleasantry about Baldo Howard, the author of the $3,000 prize tale, which it wasn't really a prize, our friend of the Burlington, Vermont Sentinel has his joke as well as the rest, and the best squib of the lot it is too, and he quotes this little rhyme, when Howard, favorite child of fame, got that 3,000, I know, the robber of the Rhine became a robber of the rhino. So that's all very clever. And then um, comes Matthew's April 17, 1850 review, his own review. Now, this is what I found recently. And I found it because I was tracking down the series of articles by Matthew in the 1850 Portland transcript, all called local sketches. And they had to do with local businesses, and they also had to do with the jail and the almshouse. And I'm going to compare some of that with other known works, including the work that people think was written by Margaret Fuller. They talk about how Margaret Fuller visited jails and so on. Well, that was Matthew Franklin Whittier. She may have tagged along. She may not have. I don't know. But Matthew has a long history of social philanthropy and social causes, and one of them was especially debtor's prison, and also insane asylums and prisons and so forth. So um, he was at it again with these local sketches in 1850, and I'll compare that one of these days probably. But in any case, immediately next door to the local sketch in the May 4, 1850 edition of the Portland Transcript, which we have here. This is the first historical volume I ever purchased, 1850, and most of the pages are in pretty terrible shape, but nonetheless, I have a fondness for it because it was my very first one. I had no idea you could even do that. Bought it on eBay, and then I subsequently bought quite a few more. Anyway, right next to it is a review of Mistake of a Lifetime, so we're going to look at that. 
I'm going to read most, if not all of it. This is going to be an extended quote. It's also a little difficult to read, so I'm going to pump my light up here. Apologies for the cosmetics, but I have to be able to see. Sometimes when I make mistakes reading these things, partly it's because the type is small, and partly it's because I just have trouble seeing in the lighting that I've got for myself. I need, really need to just put this right down on it. All right, here we go. It's a pretty long review. I probably will read the whole thing. You may fast forward if you're bored, or you may just stop if you're bored. The greatest work of the age, all caps, the mistake of a lifetime, and it gives the, the specs and the name and so on. We, with no little shame, plead guilty of having read the first. This is really scathing, this one. It's either written by Edward Elwell or it's written by Erastus Gould, the owners and editors. And it's kind of odd because over here in the two readers and correspondence section, it says, look out for Spike next week. Well, that's the series Ethan Spike that Matthew wrote for this paper, and they got a lot of publicity and a lot of readership out of Ethan Spike. And when people would praise the Portland transcript, they would especially mention the genius of Ethan Spike. So right next to Matthew's local sketches, which is, and this one is the sights and scenes at the railroad station, which was typical for Matthew because he was a traveling um, postal inspector that wrote as quails about traveling on the railroad all the time. So uh, right next to local sketches and on the other page where they're saying to look out for Ethan Spike, they're trashing his novel, which proves that they didn't know that he'd written it. We know that he wrote it because of the uh, card that was in the Boston Weekly Museum. So definitely it's his piece. But clearly Elwell and Gould did not know that Matthew was the author. That's how tight Matthew kept these things, how close to his chest Matthew kept these publications. Even his own brother wouldn't know, typically, I think. So again, we, with no little shame, plead guilty of having read the first 30 pages to this astonishing production. But as the man said who was sent to jail, we, quote, only went there for the good of others. It was that our readers might fully appreciate its beauties, that we underwent the nausea of reading it. But the work itself is by no means so noteworthy as the manner of its introduction to the public. Some weeks since, it was announced in nearly every paper in the country that the most discriminating and liberal publisher, see, he's a conservative, so they're joking about him being liberal, the most discriminating and liberal publisher, F. Gleason, we wonder he don't attach Esquire to his name, he is eminently worthy of the distinction, was about to publish a most magnificent romance for which he had paid the distinguished author, who, by the way, nobody ever heard of before, the astonishing sum of $3,000. Well, they didn't know Waldo Howard was a pseudonym, and apparently they didn't guess it. Esquire was Matthew's joking, you know, uh, addition to the name. <laughs> he wasn't serious about it. And moreover, that the author had demanded a share of the profits, which Mr. Gleason, with his usual generosity, had very readily granted. But what was the most astonishing of all, this great work, beside which the productions of Goldsmith, of Irving, and of Hawthorne dwindle into insignificance, was to be sold for two and a half cents. Now, Matthew sold that for 12 and a half cents to make it affordable for the masses because he was trying to raise the moral level of society, see? So he wanted the, the, the intended audience to be able to afford it. So he took the hit on that, probably. And certainly he took the hit on that in terms of uh, his royalties. And it probably was a condition of sale. Matthew said it can't be sold for any more than 12 and a half cents. See? Oh, most magnanimous Mr. Gleason. Well, before we had fairly recovered from the bewilderment caused by this announcement, out came all the papers again with highly laudatory notices of the work itself, which they all professed to have received. And still the wonder grew. One thing about these notices was very remarkable. They were all word for word the same. While we were pondering over this phenomenon, we received a printed slip containing the identical notice and the offer of $2 if we would publish it, and at the same time learned that the editor of the Olive Branch had received $5 for inserting it, and so the secret was out. But as we had not received the work, 
and the notice asserted that we had, and as we never endorse a book without at least reading the title page, we concluded that the notice couldn't go into the transcript, Mr. Gleason's two dollars to the contrary notwithstanding, and feeling very certain that we should not be honored with a copy of the work, we stepped into Bears to purchase it, having a desire to place it with our collection of literary curiosities, we were handed a thin pamphlet with a dashing title page and containing 32 pages with this announcement at the bottom, the second number of this work will be published, etc., etc. And so we didn't get the $3,000 work for a nine pence after all. Thus, humbug number two came out. So what he received was the first number of, of this. This is the second one that was announced. Meantime, the flaming notice which had appeared in all the papers, and you've seen the notice, I wouldn't call it flaming, included the best New York weeklies, was doing its work upon the unsuspecting public. The people rushed eagerly to purchase the great work which had been so, quote, highly extolled by Willis of the Home Journal and other eminent newspaper critics. But what a falling off from their anticipation was here. Some of the purchasers turned indignantly upon the editors who had misled them and complained of being defrauded of nine pence. One Albany editor, against whom this charge was made, replied very coolly that he had inserted the notice as an advertisement and that the purchaser ought to have known better than to buy the work. And really speaking, it's kind of a hybrid. It's kind of half advertisement and half editorial. But that's on Gleason's head. That wasn't Matthew's doing. But the work itself, ah, how shall we do it justice? Has the reader ever perused that most touching tale of tenderness, my dear Arabella? If he has, he may form a faint conception of the treat in store for him in this work. Not that the renowned Waldo exceeds the no less renowned Josiah in the, quote, touching tenderness of his style, but that in graphic description and boldness of execution, especially in the way of knocking down pickpockets and cutthroats, he is unapproached and unapproachable. And then, too, the tale is adorned with quotations from Shakespeare, Goldsmith, and Tom Moore, which float upon its surface with all the grace and appropriateness of flowers in a bucket of swill. Now, Matthew was very well read, and in all of his work, he would bring in uh, quotes of poetry. So this was typical of his style. In short, the work promises to equal, if we ever see the end of it, that great production, Hildebrand Carable, or the Haunted Hogsty. In conclusion, we would recommend to Mr. Gleason for the title of his next publication, the following, The Astonishing Disclosures of a Literary Humbug, or The Way to Turn Trash into Gold. Now, <laughs> I'm going to read the opening to The Mistake of a Lifetime. This is going to be a long entry. We're already at 39. So, um, let's see. I will just read a little bit of the opening. I don't know how far I'll go into it, but I want to give you an idea of what he's talking about. Keep in mind now that there's probably some people that could say there's no way an American author could have set a Christmas carol in London. Well, this is set in London. Matthew probably did quite a bit of research about London and talked to people who had lived there or grown up there. So he was very careful to be authentic. He wrote uh, adventure stories in South American countries and all kinds of places. <clears throat> Occasionally, he was not quite authentic, but that had to do usually with biology, about boa constrictors biting somebody or things like that, things that were not really known in his century necessarily, or that he hadn't studied. Chapter 1, The Tap Room of St. Giles. And then we have a, a quote from Shakespeare, Now let it work. Mischief thou art afoot, take then what course thou wilt. The street lamps were burning dimly in St. Giles, London, and the thick haze of night brooded over the eastern portion of the great metropolis with more than its wonted density. The vast overgrown city was slumbering, or rather the more respectable portion of it were wrapped in the still mantle of sleep, while the noise and riotous dissipation that seemed indigenous to this section of the town came bursting forth in rude boisterousness and undefined sounds from the broken windows of the tottering tenements, and now from some damp cellar's mouth, half underground. The night police frequently passed in their rounds either end of the dark narrow streets, 
but they seemed to give no heed to the turmoil and rioting so long as it was confined within doors and did not burst forth into the open light in the streets. They had become calloused to these bacchanalian scenes and vulgar habits by intimacy with the people who inhabit these sections of the town and did not care to interfere with them unless their duty and instructions compelled them to do so. It is here that we must introduce the reader in the opening of our story. The clock had already struck ten one summer's night when a couple of figures turned the corner from a large thoroughfare on George's in the field and quietly made their way down one of the narrow and dirty lanes referred to. They moved like persons who were fully aware of the vile character of the neighborhood and who were on their guard to prevent being surprised while the stealthiness with which they evidently picked their way through the riotous district seemed to indicate some delicate and peculiar object in view. There was quite a difference in the size of the two persons. The larger was dressed in a coarse top coat and cloth cap with rough top boots, his figure presenting tokens of remarkable physical strength from the great breadth of shoulders and chest and other signs that might have been seen even in that dim, uncertain light. As he moved on, his gait discovered that he was lame, which rendered his walk somewhat awkward, though his step was quick and unyielding, notwithstanding this blemish. His companion must have been some years his junior, for his figure and bearing evinced the uncompleted frame of youth, though his form was stout and well-filled, and he walked like one who had the resolution and the strength to hold his ground in any emergency. As they passed now and then beneath the street lamps that were lit along the road at intervals, his face appeared much darker than the others, having a deep olive cast, such as imbues the skin in the tropics and the Indies. Like his elder companion, he was dressed in a coarse overcoat, cap, and top boots. Neither of them seemed to carry any weapons, though they were in such a dangerous section, yet they might have had arms concealed beneath their ample coats. They paused now for a moment before one of the noisy houses that lined the street and listened in silence to the sounds of revelry within. This is the house. I have marked it well, said the elder of the two. It is a dram shop, said the other, peering in at a crack. Yes, and of the vilest kind, a sort of rendezvous for burglars and thieves, said the eldest, taking his stand where he could gain a view of the interior. Half of them are drunk, continued the younger, still looking in at a crack of the crazy old building occupied for a tap room, so many of which abound in this locality. Do you see the woman who keeps the shop just behind that bar? Yes, fat as a porpoise, replied the other. Do you know her name? They call her Mother Giles, replied the elder of the two. Is this where you are going in? asked the younger. Yes, said his companion. We will enter quietly as possible and call for something to drink, and after that I will take the first opportunity to draw the old woman into conversation. If I can accomplish my object by gentle means and without force, why all the better, but if we must, why we must, at all hazards, he continued, with a meaning look at the other. This is, I mean, already I'm pulled into it. This is an excellent book. So in order for Elwell or Gould, the editors of the transcript, to call it nauseating, you know, they really had to be prejudiced against it. And what it is, I think, is that Gleason was conservative, they were liberal, and anything Gleason did was fair game for ridicule, see. Um, and they had no idea that this was their own star writer, <laughs> and they had no idea that he had been publishing since uh, childhood at age 12 in 1825. Um, 25 years ago, he'd started publishing. Uh, he, they had no idea that he had written many, many adventure stories, you know, and that they'd been getting published under somebody else's name for a whole year in the flag of our union. <laughs> you know, they had no idea of any of this. Well, the scholars are every bit as wrong about my work, and I don't know how they're going to feel when they figure out that all the ridicule they've privately heaped on me and occasionally in, you know, online forums or Facebook groups or, you know, occasionally in correspondence, that they were dead wrong about it. You know, I don't know how they're going to feel when that happens. I hope they feel bad about it. <laughs> Frankly, there's still a little bit of Matthew in me as far as revenge is concerned. Now, there's one more piece of evidence here in the Portland transcript that's particularly interesting. I had found this before, but I didn't understand the context. Matthew, in the May 18 edition, a couple editions later, 
if I if I'm counting correctly here, he is responding to this review. And how does he respond to it? Now, whether they know he's writing this or not, I'm guessing they know he's writing this. And what he does is to write a parody of his own book. And they publish that parody, see? But he publishes in a, in a style that definitely identifies it as his. And this is going to take a little work to explain what I mean by this. But back in 1848, at the very beginning of the Boston Weekly Museum, um, in the September 23, 1848 edition, Matthew was making fun of literary contests where they gave big prizes. And he and the editor at that time colluded to kind of do this parody of, of the prize winning tale. And Matthew pretended to be three different characters, uh, the roaring rhinoceros, the laughing hyena, and I forget the other one. Um, well, the, the Roaring Rhinoceros was a play on words of rhino, the Roaring Rhino, see, the one that makes money. But the Laughing Hyena had a very strange style. And I'm going to uh, read a little bit of that. Here we have the Saracen's Grave, a legend of the East. I believe a Saracen is an Arab by the Laughing Hyena. It was about the year of our Lord, A.D. B.C., 4,280, one summer morning in April, about the 31st of June, when an amiable-looking Hungarian warrior, whose mustached and beardless face denoted him to be a Saracen priest in disguise, might have been seen by anyone who was looking that way, slowly descending the Hartz Mountains at a very rapid pace. His broad two-handed sword hung at his side gaily over his back, and its fearful jingling contrasted merrily with the sound of the rising sunset, which spread its gray mantle afar at his feet. I'm going to do one more paragraph. You get a sense of what's going on here. On the right of this jolly looking traveler and immediately at his back, a few steps in advance, a mammoth bull terrier of Angola breed ambled gracefully over the smooth and rocky pathway. He appeared doubtfully certain that his master was a woman and ever and anon silently growled at the absence of the impediments which tangled their unobstructed descent, upon which manifestation of pathetic mirth his master would delightfully frown, and drawing his bright jet mantle more loosely about him, continue to knit his brows, darn his luck, and weave his thoughts into a more abstracted system of mythology. Suddenly, at last, he started up from his brief slumber, and gathering a few of the ripe precipices which abounded in that celestial forest, made a hasty meal and inquired for the princess. So what we have is somebody who contradicts himself like constantly. Every other word, he contradicts himself. I haven't seen anybody else in, in the 19th century or any other century use that style. It's, it's even more specific to Matthew than the Joe Strickland style. So Matthew is is signing the mistake of a lifetime with idiosyncratic styles that posterity may identify with him, see, which I have done. Now, here again, in the May 18, 1850 Portland transcript, responding to their scathing review, we have, and once again, I've got to get my light going here. I apologize for that. I, I'm, Turned it down, but now I have to turn it back up again. Sublime extract from the great work. We will not assure our readers that the following is an extract from the 1005th chapter of The Robber of the Rhine Valley, which we have been furnished with in advance of publication, for such assurance is needless. Only the immortal Waldo could have penned the following magnificent and thrilling extract, editor, transcript. Now, what follows is not, I thought it was at first, but this is not actually from the book. Now, this is Matthew's parody of his own book in his Laughing Hyena style, which he pioneered in the Boston Weekly Museum in 1848. On one cold winter's day in the month of July, a poor man, clad in all the habiliments and gold and tinsel of the rich, 
was footing along on horseback in an open boat over a long and dreary desert. Not a hill, tree, rock, or spot of green appeared to cheer him in his tedious ascent of the vast mountain which lay spread out before him in fertile heaps as far as the eye could reach. Huge precipices lay scattered in his path, and ever and anon would his footsteps mingle in sweet cadence with the black waters of the yellow sky over whose precipitous plains he scrambled with all the agility of a stout pair of cowhide boots which encased his hose in a red fiery aspect. Egyptian darkness had now settled down upon the earth, and the noonday sun threw his cold and piercing rays full in the face of the traveler as he pursued his northern course toward the beautiful streaks of light that now illumined the east, caused by the rising of the setting sun in the dim distance of the present future. The moon cast her pale inky light of midnight brightness over the shades of perambulating hencoops, whose blue rays of an ambient green, being firmly buckled to the coattails of a large box of Brandreth's pills, greatly assisted him in his precarious passage over the lengthened shadows of the grassy and verdureless lake. Not only is it the same style, it's practically the same context and, and situation as the uh, Laughing Hyena wrote in the September 1848 Boston Weekly Museum. In other words, through this parody of his own book, in response to that scathing review by the editors of the Portland Transcript, Matthew has signed The Mistake of a Lifetime a second time for posterity. He signed it the first time with the Joe Strickland style card, and he signed it the second time with this uh, supposed extract, this parody. See, and nobody was ever the wiser. And <clears throat> what's different about this particular work from some of the others I've presented is that nobody ever claimed it. It's brilliant. This is really a masterpiece, given, again, who his audience was and what he was intending to accomplish with it. It's brilliant. But the reviews were so bad, so mocking, because nobody, because he had no reputation. See, Walter Howard was had no reputation. So this is how much reputation counts in fame. If nobody knows who the heck you are, and you publish something brilliant, and everybody makes fun of it, nobody had any interest in claiming that for themselves. So it was never falsely claimed. It was never attributed. Scholars paid no attention to it. It just disappeared in, in history books, except the public ate it up, apparently. You know, so um, there we have it. That's the trail. And uh, I don't know how long this video is going to be. It's probably about an hour. So there really isn't anything more to this except uh, I have four copies, four originals of this book. Um, I figured that was enough, so I didn't buy any more. There was the one more on A Books. I did manage, I figured it was better to let it sit there with Matthew Franklin Whittier's name on it, since he was convinced by what I said and changed it. It was better to let it sit up there, you know, as kind of advertising. But somebody bought it, believing that it was Matthew Franklin Whittier's, and when they got it, I don't know if they felt cheated, or I don't know if they, they read it and realized this is exceptionally good and started looking into who Matthew Franklin Whittier was. They have an original copy of, of this book, whoever it was that bought it, and they'd better hang on to it because someday, if anybody ever takes me seriously, it's going to be worth a fortune, you know? <laughs> so uh, I have two original copies of The Raven as it came out in American Review, and they cost me plenty. And that's how absolutely convinced I was. I mean, I have a little tiny inheritance, which is dwindling. I need to try to find a job if something doesn't happen pretty soon. Um, it's not going to be easy. I'm worried about being on the street. Um, but I went ahead and spent a huge amount of money on both of those because I was, this was when I, when I first was looking into it, really. Uh, seriously, I said, I'm absolutely convinced that Matthew was the author of The Raven. And I was right. I've got a ton of evidence. <clears throat> I can flat out prove it. But um, if Matthew had published The Raven as Waldo Howard, would it ever have been famous? 
you know? Or was it because Edgar Allan Poe put his name on it that it became famous? You know, it's a good question. If Charles Dickens had published The Mistake of a Lifetime, or Edgar Allan Poe, or somebody else that was famous, would it have become famous? Would it have become taken, would it have been taken seriously? You know, I don't know the answer to that. I do know there was a study years ago where psychologists took a bunch of wine experts and they put cheap wine in, in expensive bottles and they all raved about it. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> labeling has a lot to do with how things are perceived, definitely. But uh, I'm telling you, this is a masterwork by somebody who had been writing for 25 years at the time that it came out. And it was designed to be even better than the excellent stories that Francis Duravage had been publishing in the Flag of Our Union, like every every other edition, practically. Um, and there we have it. Uh, I don't know how to end this. I can only say that, you know, I'm very, this is very fragile, but I'm very pleased to have this. <laughs> this is the second installment of the serialized version. Some of these things that I bought online, if people had any idea what they were, I'd never be able to touch them. And in a way, it's kind of not fair, but that's my little uh, personal benefit from Matthew Franklin Whittier being completely snubbed and ignored by everybody, including all the scholars, is that I can pick up historical antiquarian copies of his work for a relative song, except where somebody famous like Edgar Allan Poe managed to get hold of it and make themselves famous by it. I can't touch an original copy of A Christmas Carol. It's like $8,000. You know, I barely was able to get hold of an original copy of The Raven and so on. But uh, these things, you know, this was not really all that expensive. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs>